Ah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Faces of Carlsbad, a program that you see only on Channel 23. And we're sponsored by Intrepid Potash. And this program brings you people that you might know. They might even bring you a person who's your neighbor. And sometimes you have no idea who this person is. Amazing. But the next person I'm going to interview is a longtime friend of mine. Incredible. Who disappeared into space a number of years ago. <laughs> And a couple of years back, he came back to Carlsbad and made everybody very happy again. And I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Dwayne Mounts. Dwayne. Good to see you, Bob. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. Well, you've been back for a while, but uh, I'll tell you something. When you left, uh, you left a lot of people very unhappy here in Carlsbad because they ha you have great respect. Uh, they, they really respected you quite a bit, and it, it just felt... That one of the nicest guys in town left, and uh, we're glad you're back. Well, I appreciate that. But this program, we're going to find out a little more about Dwayne Mounts, uh, where you were born, where your parents came from, actually, okay. and uh, where you were born, where you grew up, and uh, fill us in. Okay, well, my, my dad was born and raised in Stephenville, Texas, which is about 60 miles southwest of Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. My mother was born in Slayton, Texas, which is about 15 miles out of Lubbock. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, met in Stephenville. My mother was one of eight children, and she was one of the younger ones. And uh, by that time, her parents were getting older and everything else, so she went to live with her sister yeah. in Stephenville. And her and my dad uh, met and uh, were married, and then uh, they were going to live in Stephenville. But my mom had real bad hay fever, so they moved back into the West Texas area of Lubbock and moved into Lubbock. Uh, my dad uh, started off as what they call a meat cutter now. We used to call them butchers. Yeah, he was yeah. Known as. And it, uh, so he cut meat uh, in Leveland, Texas. Uh, they'd moved from Lubbock to Leveland. Uh, it's more steady work. An interesting thing there is when they were still living in Lubbock, he hitchhiked every day to Leveland and back. Oh my Didn't gosh. have a car, and that's about oh 30 miles. And every day he'd hitchhike over to Leveland, hitchhike back, until finally they got the money to move to Leveland. And uh, he was working for a company there called Piggly Wiggly, which is no longer in effect. Mm -hmm. used to, I think there used to be one here years ago. Yeah. But nevertheless, uh, I'm the youngest of four children. I've got an older sister, Cecilia, that lives in Level End to this day. I've got a brother that named Ronnie lives in Amarillo, mm -hmm. a brother named Charles that lives in Lubbock. And uh, I've lived here 36 years. Uh, when I retired from the police department, Barbara and I decided to move to Lubbock. And we moved over, and Barbara was uh, what they call a unit director for the Children's Home of Lubbock. We lived on campus. Uh, we did not keep any of the children in our homes, but there were about eight homes there with children in them. And Barbara was a supervisor over two of them. The yeah, let's, before we go into that too deep, because I find that very fascinating, uh, let's find out uh, where did you run into your wife? That's an interesting story. Uh, we met in all places Lubbock, Texas. Mm -hmm. I worked for Gibson uh, Discount Store and uh, I had graduated from high school yeah. and uh, she came in one day she had this real pretty long red hair and was wearing boots and in Lubbock that was you didn't see that much at that time and uh, so um, anyway it caught my attention at that time I was really dressed in western boots and everything really into that mm -hmm. and so we met and kind of found out her cousin worked there and so we just got to talking and of all things her grandparents lived they're now deceased lived in Stephenville and their farm was right next to my great-grandparents farm oh my gosh and we didn't know that until we started talking and of course, then we started visiting, and I got brave enough to ask her out on a date. And uh, were you a shy person? I was at that time. Mm -hmm. I was really shy, especially around girls. Yeah. I like to tell the kids now that I work with in the school system that I had a hundred girlfriends when I was little, but none of them ever knew it. You know, I just <laughs> claimed them all. You know, <laughs> yeah, hundred girlfriends. So. <laughs> Nobody. Oh, that's funny. But um, anyway, so we uh, we met and we're dating long distance. Uh, she lived here in Carlsbad. Her dad uh, is retired from uh, Western Ag uh, Potash Mine. Mm -hmm. And we dated long distance. I lived in Lubbock. She lived here. Uh, then right after she graduated, uh, we married uh, in November 1972. And moved back to Leveland, which is South Plains College, for a couple of years. And then moved back to Carlsbad. 
So yeah, you, or we moved to Carlsbad for my first time. This year, you will, you will, you will celebrate your 40th wedding this, anniversary. This coming November 4th. We'll have been married 40 years. Oh, my and, gosh. Uh, she's prettier now to me than she ever has been. Uh, she's my best friend and uh, you know, love of my life. Keeps mm -hmm. things going for me. Yeah. And, but again, we moved here. Uh, I worked uh, at IMC, the Potash Mine at that time, International Mineral and Chemical. Right. It's mosaic now. Yeah. Uh, then I went into insurance for Did you uh, ever know Gary Hardesty when you worked? Yes. At, at I didn't know him at that time, but mm -hmm. I met him later. Uh, uh, in the organization that, that he was in and we met and everything, so mm -hmm. I do know Gary. Um, anyway, I worked there a few years, went into insurance business for a few years, and then when I turned 31, uh, back in 1981, I finally made up my mind to do what I'd always wanted to do, mm -hmm. and that was become a police officer. <coughs> I come from a history or a family of police officers. Uh, a little known fact uh, oh, that yeah. our 15 minutes of glory is, is my cousin, who is now deceased, was on the Dallas Police Department, arrest, arrested Lee Harvey Oswald uh, the day that he shot President mm -hmm. Kennedy. He arrested him at the movie theater. Your the cousin my arrested cousin did. Oh, my goodness. And, of course, we grew up hearing those stories. And when I say we, I have other cousins. Right now, I think there's a total of about 12 of us that are either in law enforcement or have been in law enforcement. But in 1981, when I was 31, I uh, finally wait. took the plunge and became a police officer and spent 21 years with the Carlsbad Police Department. And 21 years? 21 years. Retired in 2002, going on 10 years, and was involved with the D.A.R.E. program mm -hmm. for 12 of those years. And I always say that I found myself what I really wanted to do when I became a police officer and then what really enhanced, I don't know, I, I don't know any other word to use right now. My career is really for me to find myself yeah. with the D.A.R.E. program where I work with children. And Working I did that with for kids. 12 years. I uh, retired in 2002 and then was fortunate enough that we had Officer Carl Guillermo who took over and uh, has now done it for nine years, uh, the D.A.R.E. program. He just retired. And just yeah, retired himself. Another nice, wonderful guy. Absolutely. Wonderful person. So, but you went back to Lubbock. Yes, I did. And uh, tell us what drew you back to Lubbock. Well, again, Barbara took a position there. She had been working at Carlsbad Mental Health, and she took a position with the Children's Home of Lubbock mm -hmm. uh, to become a unit director. And uh, she was also wanting to get her license to become a therapist. So we went over there for that main reason, and they were going to help train her to do that, plus pay her to be a unit director. And it didn't work out because she was putting in 60, 70 hours a week because we lived on campus even though we didn't have kids. She was always constantly there. And so uh, we spent five years there and she still wanted to, to become a therapist, mm -hmm. you know. So we moved back to Carlsbad. She's working again with Carlsbad Mental Health. Oh. She does have her license and she's just completing her clinical work that she needs to do and then she'll be fully certified as a therapist, hopefully within with him hopefully by December. And she's going to go in into that work then, huh? She's already really into it. Yeah. Uh, right now she works with two branches of uh, Carlsbad Mental Health yeah. where she's um, working with their Via de Esperanza, which is the building behind the police department. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she works with the people there who have addiction problems. And then she also helps with the crossroads, which is out by where the old fountain, or is where the old fountain uh, restaurant used right, to be. Right, used to be, yes. And okay. Happy they Valley. also have young ladies there that have children that have also had problems, you know, with drug and alcohol. So for the last several years, we've been kind of doing parallel type things. When I was teaching D.A.R.E. drug prevention, and then she's working with those that already have gotten into this situation. That's a very, very sad situation, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, and it's more prominent than I think than what a lot of people believe or mm -hmm. even know, the, and the, the destruction it does to families. Tears them apart. Tears them apart, and then now that uh, I am now working as an assistant PE teacher in the school system, plus I do teen court in the evenings. So I work with the young kids and I work with teenagers, and I see the result of it with the children. Uh, coming from the homes where uh, either one or both parents are not involved yeah. Uh, yeah. for different reasons. And 
drugs has a big part of that. What, what's wrong uh, with so many of our families, uh, the husband and wife? Can't they see what is happening to their children? Well, that's, you know, all I can tell you is from experience and, and things such as this is it kind of goes back genera more than just one generation. Um, some of the people that you have now that are addicted to drugs grew up in a family where it was the same situation. Just like you probably have heard where abuse is a generational thing. Uh -huh. It's not corrected. Uh, child is abused. As a child, you think they would never grow up to do that, but oftentimes they do. Mm -hmm. And of course, I am not a I am not a therapist. I don't know all of those things. I yeah. just know from my experience. But uh, the breakup of the family. Uh, I was talking to someone last night. Uh, divorce has a lot to do with it. I believe where yeah. people do not stay committed anymore. Well, that's for sure. Also, those who choose to live together and and then after a while, then they leave. Well, then there's the child that's that's left. Yeah. And again, it's uh, it's not a problem that I'm an expert in. I'm just telling you what I see firsthand. And do, w when you two get home at night, do you s uh, sometimes sit down and discuss what has gone through that particular day? Just about every night. Every night. We kind of are our own little, uh, I guess our own little therapist. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're not allowed to mention names. No, she no, never, no. She no. never mentions names. I never mention names, but we yeah. talk about cases. Uh, I have learned a lot just over the last year of her working with with these parents and these grown-ups from that perspective. I've yeah. seen it from the children's perspective. But um, we do because it just helps us both to be able to let it out. And one thing I've always appreciated about Barbara, and I believe I'm the same way, when I was a police officer, it's like, again, I was talking to a young lady last night. Uh, police officers have a very difficult job. Yes, indeed they do. And very stressful. At one time they had the highest divorce rate of any career. I'm not sure about that anymore. Very high alcohol alcoholism. Uh, it's because of what they do and what they see. Day yeah. in, day out, day in, day out. And the, what I was telling the young lady last night is it's always good for that police officer to have someone to go home to to be able to vent to be able to let that loose. Uh, oftentimes police officers, nothing wrong with this, but after work they may get together and socialize and, and they talk about things. But when you get home is when you can really share your feelings. Absolutely. And if you want to shed tears, which I've done many times over different situations I've been seeing, um, someone getting killed in a wreck, someone being stabbed, shot, whatever, yeah. especially when it involves children, it really rips you apart, but you have this facade when you're a police officer because that's the way you're trained, you know, and uh, you don't show the emotion. Well, I, I ride with the police, mm -hmm. and I've taken 138-hour shift rides with them. And we've gone from funny little things that have happened, which makes a nice feeling, to uh, a suicide mm -hmm. uh, that I actually was there and saw and another suicide that I heard about two hours later when the, one of the officers called me and told me what happened. And we had handled that particular case earlier in the evening. But then you see the other side where I rode with a, I've ridden with a number of female officers too. And you know, you always have this doubt, how is this guy that she has just stopped for speeding, how is he going to treat her with respect? And it's always nice to see the lady treat him with such great respect that he is also respectful right. <laughs> and apolog apologetic to her for doing what he shouldn't have been doing. Well, and if you don't mind, I'd like to bring up Officer Kim Redmond. Oh, who, yes, who please was with do. our department and yes. had to take disability because of being in a, in a shooting incident. Yeah. Uh, a wonderful lady. Yes. And I had the opportunity of working with her. Uh, I'll be honest with you, one of the best police officers I've ever worked with. Yeah, I, I've ridden, I rode with her right. before this accident yeah. happened. Very compassionate, and very absolutely. kind. And she was able to diffuse a lot of problems just by her personality. That's right. And, uh, you know, she's the one that I work with the most. We've had others, and mm -hmm. that they've all been good. Yeah. But uh, Kim was exceptional. And uh, 
she's still very active and things like that. But um, we, we, I say we, the Carlsbad Police Department lost a good officer when she did, you know, have to retire yeah. and uh, spent many weeks in Lubbock. And uh, after that shooting incident, but well, they didn't even know. They thought for a while that she wasn't uh, going to make it. Yeah, for the longest time. Yeah, but, um, I would go up and try to visit her in CCU and everything, and because I lived there. Mm -hmm. and then there was come the time whenever when she was a finally in a private room, I was I was able to go visit with her and yeah. and her husband, and and we've even gotten together. I was in a real bad wreck in 2006 in Lubbock, and. Uh, all practical purposes, I should have been killed. Uh, I was involved in a near head-on, where a man come across the median. I was going to work. I worked at Texas Tech University. 6:30 in the morning, it was raining, and I was coming over on one of the overpasses on the loop. And mm -hmm. just as I got up, I saw headlights coming over the uh, over the bridge and right at me. And I didn't even have time. Just the only thing I can remember saying is, "We're going to hit." And and I do remember the boom and the clanging and all that of the metal and spent three weeks in the hospital and almost died twice. And I'm only telling that story is because after I was out, mm. Kim and her husband came to visit. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, very, very inter interesting, very emotional for us to sit down and her tell what happened to her oh, and me tell what happened to us. The near-death experience. And, you know, until you've been mm. there, you don't really realize how precious life is. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this uh, wreck that you were involved in, we heard about that and scared the tar out of all of us around here. Was this man falling asleep uh, when he crashed into you? That, that is my theory. Mm -hmm. You know, 6.30 in the morning, uh, the police, when I finally got a report, that was interesting in itself, the police report consisted of one page front and one page on the back on a severe crash like that in Carlsbad, when I was a police officer, it would have involved eight, ten pages. Yes. And uh, one page would have been an entire uh, diagram of what happened. Right. He had a little stick figure diagram. He, they wrote the other man for speeding. So I've had oh, people ask geez. me, was he drunk? Well, of course, I don't know. I don't know what it was, yeah. but it was my theory that he did go to sleep. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, by the time he woke up, it was it was too late. Oh, gosh. Well, how many weeks were you in the hospital? I was in there three weeks. Three and, weeks, uh, my gosh. I was in CCU twice. Um, it, um, eventually, it, it, it deflated my lung, broke all the ribs on my left side, broke my shoulder. Oh, my broke, gosh. It fractured all the ribs on my right side, and then it ruptured my spleen. And so the, where they had the most complication is they Jeez. needed me to set up from my lung, had a tube in it to help me breathe, and, but they needed me to lay down from my spleen. And, of course, I was in and out of it just drugged, you know, with the medication. Mm. I do remember the doctor telling my wife, we need to save his spleen. He really needs that. And then, of course, I know several days probably passed after that. Then it ruptured, and they had to go in and take it out. Oh and then gosh. I remember the doctor coming in and said, oh, he can live without a spleen. And I have been able to live without it, you know, and uh, my lung is completely healed. Uh, I am completely healed. What about the ribs? The ribs are all healed. The shoulder, it, it was shattered. It's completely healed. Wow, you were lucky in I that respect. Very, very blessed. Yeah. I, I give credit to God for that. Um, Psalms 118.24 is my favorite scripture in the Bible where it says, This is the day the Lord hath made. Rejoice and be glad in it because you don't know that you have tomorrow. And I learned that that day. Mm -hmm. And even though I still go back to my ways and, you know, get into the cares and of life and everything else, when I look in the mirror every day and I see the scars, and I, you know, I go, oh, yes, that's right. You better enjoy today. And I have a lot to live for. One other thing I would like to mention, I've, I've tried to do this before. When I was able to finally get into a room, and I cannot believe this, uh, a little re really interesting story. When I was in CCU, it was almost like hell to me, mm -hmm. and not to be ugly, but I was so drugged on morphine, and I was having so many nightmares, it was Jeez. just driving me crazy. Finally, they came in one morning and said, Mr. Mounts, we're going to move you up to your private room, 777. 
<laughs> so they did. So and they I did thought, wow, that's something. You know, of course, I'm still kind of. Then they moved him into this room that was not an ordinary hospital room. Mm -hmm. It was a suite. It was huge. Oh my gosh. And uh, so it really worked out because Barbara would spend the night with me at night, and then she would work during the day. But um, anyway, when I was able to start being more uh, aware of what was going on, uh, it just. You know, just had a lot of time there to think and a lot of things happening. And we knew people in Lubbock. Yeah. But my point is, is I wanted to bring up how tremendous this community is. I have a basket at home that's about, about like this. It's full of cards from people here in Carlsbad, from banks, from Jeez. businesses, from everything, you know, wishing me well. And oh. uh, it was awesome. The newspaper called my wife, did an article on me at that time about the wreck, and you know, just a lot of things I never expected, but the outpouring of love, and it just, you know, you can't, you can't beat Carlsbad for that. No, that's one of the reasons no, that's, why we want to come back. That's, that's for sure. Well, we're, we're glad you're back. What do you do in your spare time now? Well, I don't have a lot of spare time. Mm -hmm. I'm in the school system as an assistant PE teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, at two, I get out about 2.45 to 3.00. And from there, I usually go right over to Carlsbad Municipal Court because I'm also the coordinator for Teen Court. And we do that in the evenings. Oh, my gosh. So we started that back in June of this mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlsbad has had Teen Court before. Yes. In the late 90s, 2000s. That's right. I, I wasn't that. involved with it. I don't know what happened to it. Yeah. All I know is that uh, Judge Redford and I believe Mayor Janway was really wanting to get it started again. So yeah. They approached me, and, and so I said I would do it. So we started it back in uh, June of last year, yeah. uh, and we we have teen court every Tuesday night in Carlsbad Municipal Court. Right. And it starts at six o'clock. We and for those who may not know, teen court is a regular court setting. You have a judge, yeah. which is usually a real judge or a volunteer. Yeah. I um, mean, excuse me, an attorney. Mm -hmm. Right now we have uh, Judge Costaneda, Judge Van Dyke, we have Judge Redford, we have Judge Brown. Uh, they help me. We also have Patrick Melvin and Stephanie Erickson from the DA's office. Okay. Help me. And so they take turns helping me each Tuesday night. Then we have, of course, the Carlsbad Police Department furnishes us a bailiff mm -hmm. every week. Uh, Eddy County Sheriff's Department is getting involved with us also. But the rest of it involves teenagers. That's the neat thing about Teen Court. Yeah, do they... Uh these, these cases are basically based on facts, aren't they? I mean, the they kids... Are, they are actual cases that are referred to us from either municipal court, magistrate court, or the juvenile probation I office. I see. Most of them come from the juvenile probation office for all different kinds of uh, what we would call petty misdemeanors to misdemeanors. Everything from speeding to... Um, Reckless driving to minor possession of alcohol, possession of drugs, possession, possession of drug trafficking. Oh, so they're real cases. They are very real cases. And when they're referred to us, uh, I interview the defendants with their parents. That's mm -hmm. what I call the kids who are referred to yeah, us. Yeah, right. And we interview them. Then I set, a, I set an appointment up for them to have court on Tuesday night. So we average four cases every Tuesday night. Mm. I have around 20 teenagers who volunteer their time to help me. They've been trained to be attorneys. Oh, my gosh. They've been trained by judges and attorneys to be the attorneys. So they're the, actually the ones doing the cases. You have a defense attorney and a prosecuting yes, attorney. Yes. That's and wonderful. And then the jury is made up of teenagers. They're the ones that make the decision. Yeah. Uh, part of the penalty mm. for a defendant coming into teen court is they have to serve on the jury. Mm. So a lot of time, or every every week that we have a trial, the defendants who have already been in the defendant's chair <laughs> will be in the juror's chair. Oh my gosh! And they get to help make the uh, decide the penalty. Yeah. Uh, for the for the case. Now we have guidelines that they go by, but they're the ones that make the decisions on what the penalty is for these teenagers that come in. And like I said, our attorneys are trained. I would more than welcome anybody to come. Mm -hmm. If you really want to see professionalism and done by teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, they need to come to teen court. I've had attorneys, I've had judges tell me that some of these 
or our teenagers are better than a lot of the adult <laughs> attorneys, and and they do take it serious. Well, I would imagine so. And uh, when they g give these penalties out to these kids, the kids have to really go along and do this. Yes, it, it is for them to be able to complete teen court. Yeah, they do it now. Why do they do it? And why? Do, what's the advantage of coming to teen court? If they come to teen court and they complete the sentences, which is jury duty, and then they have to do community service, yeah. then those charges are dropped. Won't so be on their record. It won't be on the record. That's good. And so we usually take first offenders yeah. um, that have never been in trouble before, or maybe one or two times, and then when they're referred to us, then this is a way of helping them out. As you know, all teenagers, Jeez. I won't say all, but most teenagers are going to get into trouble a little bit. They're going to get a ticket. Almost everybody gets a ticket. Oh, yeah. You know, some kind of a little minor thing. Well, instead of that going on the record, instead of them having to pay a fine, instead of them that going on the parents' insurance, let's say, for a traffic ticket, if they come to teen court, then all of that is wiped off. It's dismissed. So it's a way Jeez. of helping out teenagers. That's fantastic. And the neat thing is it's teenagers deciding what the consequences all my life uh, as a police officer, <laughs> and even when I was a teenager, I've heard, well, the man doesn't understand us. Grown-ups don't understand us. Our parents don't mm -hmm. understand us. That's, they're just too, too hard on us. Well, they can't say that in teen court because it's teenagers versus teenagers. <laughs> they're usually hard on teenagers than, than grown-ups. That's what I've heard. Mm -hmm. they usually are. I've heard that before, yeah. that these, uh, these judges, these teen judges, are, are pretty tough. Yes, they are. That's and, remarkable. Uh, but they do hear each case. You know, there's there's always mitigating circumstances to everything. Yeah. And I've I've had a, I've really learned new respect for defense attorneys just by being in being in in teen court to see the struggles that they have sometimes to defend oh, oh their person who can be as guilty as they can be, but they uh, they are trained on how to help them. Well, the teens that are found guilty, they do carry these out, and they, they're not allowed to get out of this, are they? Well, they are. If they do not fulfill what is required of them, if they mm -hmm. do not do their jury duties, or they yeah. do not do their community service, and I tell this, I'm up front, they sign the forms there, then I refer it back to the agency. And right now, yeah. I've, we have had approximately 110 cases since June. And we probably have about a 5% what I would call failure rate, where they don't complete what they're supposed well, that's, to. Well, that's very good, though, isn't that, it? 5%? I think that's really good. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, so they, they do. They, you know, I tell them this is not something for your parents to f make you do. This is something you're doing on your own. Yeah. And it's, you, it's your responsibility. And, you know, so we, we do it that way. Um, so it's been a really successful program. That's great. Uh, we still have a lot to learn. Uh, we, we can grow so much. Uh, Hobbs, for an example, has a teen court. Theirs is mm -hmm. the number one teen court in the state of New Mexico and one of the top ten in the, in the United States, and they're our mentors. Mm. And to see where there are, we're really still in our infancy, but we are coming along. And their director mm -hmm. has you know, observed us and, and said, boy, you, you've got top notch. So that's fantastic. Sitting there. That's wonderful. We've got a lot of growing space, but and I'm learning as we go. So it's it's a learning experience, but it's a wonderful experience. Well, you and Barbara have done a good job no matter where you go. But for uh, promise me one thing that uh, you'll be very careful by driving at night or early in the morning because we don't want you to go through that again that's for sure <laughs> well you know it's it's once you now when i first started driving again yeah i was really scared yeah now even though f that happened on a four-lane highway when i'm on a two-lane highway it's really scary when you see a car coming yeah. because yeah. you never know what over? they're going to do they're going to come over yeah and you know it's just one of those things well, Duane, it's been a great experience. Thank you. And I want to thank you for being our guest today. Well, it's been you, a, really, a real pleasure. And really say hello to Barbara, too. I sure will. Because I haven't seen her for a while. Uh, and I heard that uh, she's so busy that she doesn't have time to talk to too many people anymore. Well, we do, and we need to try to slow down a little bit. But that's kind of our nature right now. So, yeah. Um, but we want to get back involved in the community. Good. Okay. Well, on behalf of Channel 23, I want to uh, wish you all a very happy Goodbye and good luck.